colleagues here on the panel, and I'm going to just ask questions here, are um, described in their bios in your in your handout. But we thought we would start with just a uh, a brief uh, intro to them, and if they if I could ask each of them in turn to take a couple of minutes to give a brief overview of your scholarly areas and interests. Brief overview. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm Stephen Sills, uh, Associate Professor of Sociology, uh, Director of the Center for Housing and Community Studies. I'm going to stand up so we can see me in the back since it's a flat room. Um, I started as a researcher on globalization, uh, migrants in Southeast Asia that were working in factories, uh, working on the issue of, of labor migrants in general. I uh, worked in Latin America, worked in the southwest of the United States with undocumented migrants. When I came back to North Carolina, I'm from uh, Greensboro, actually went to undergrad here as a Spanish major. Uh, when I came back to North Carolina, I looked around and said, what, what are the issues facing immigrants and refugees in our community? Found that housing was a serious issue. And so I've moved from working on labor and globalization in other countries to working on uh, housing issues here locally. Um, so today I work uh, with a variety of student assistants, um, uh, undergraduates, graduates, um, PhD candidates, uh, tenure track and on tenure track uh, faculty in, in multiple departments, looking at the intersection of health and housing, uh, fair housing issues, uh, we're looking at opiates uh, today. Um, we, we have a new program, uh, GC Stop. We met uh, Jim Albright this morning, uh, head of EMS, uh, doing a rapid response to opiate addiction. Um, and I pretty much go wherever the need is. I'm a research methodologist, and I kind of apply my skills to solving issues in the community. I guess I'll stand up, too. Um, I'm Swami Mohanty. I'm an assistant professor in computer science. Uh, my research, uh, again, it's uh, an applied field and it spans across a lot of domains. Uh, but what I could quantify my research as uh, is data science with applied machine learning. So my work um, goes from cybersecurity all the way to social sciences, where we are looking at uh, Twitter um, on how to utilize that for disaster-related mm -hmm. management. Uh, I work with Stephen a little bit on uh, community housing. Uh, I also use uh, deep learning and machine learning techniques for bioinformatics, uh, for natural language processing, text mining. So as you can see, I, I deal a lot with data and big data. So openness is uh, kind of what uh, at least I try to strive for. Uh, because as a community in data science, uh, it has proceeded so fast because of open data sets or open science that are reproducible science that we try to do. Hi, everybody. I'm Evan Goldstein. I'm a research assistant professor in the Department of Geological Sciences at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, my, my work really spans three different um, uh, threads, or is, is composed of three different threads. One is uh, studying coastal dunes. So coastal dunes are the first barrier of protection whenever there's a big storm in North Carolina. So homeowners and um, uh, civil services all rely on the dunes to protect us during big storm events. So I study how fast they grow and the feedback between plants and sand transport that cause them to grow. And what their impacts are going to be in climate change or also increasing storminess in the future. Uh, the other aspect of my research is on, uh, a big aspect of my research is on human landscape couplings. So whenever there's a big storm at the beach, it destroys homes. The question is, do those homes get rebuilt, and are they built at a smaller size or a larger size? And how does that play into the risk or hazard into the future? So we look at factors like that, or how protection structures like seawalls, or larger dunes, or groins and jetties, all impact the development practices on the beach to understand changing hazards in that landscape. So North Carolina, the coast, and especially North Carolina and South Carolina, and Florida, that huge part of the, part of the economy is driven by the coastal infrastructure and people visiting the tourism industry. And lastly, I, I've just become recently interested in how, as a discipline, earth scientists communicate with each other. So scholarly communications surrounding earth science, um, the literature, which spans from traditional, more traditional, like citation analysis, or understanding what is getting cited and why, and also uh, looking at how we as a community are disseminating our information out into the, uh, the broader social ecosystem. So 
through Twitter or Wikipedia or other open venues like that. Thank you. Um, could you start, let's start by, uh, if you could tell us a few ways that you rely on and use open access data sets, products, platforms, etc. So a lot of the questions that I'm trying to answer are fairly complex. Um, uh, an example, uh, this morning I was presenting on uh, the intersection of housing and health, uh, in particular asthma. Um, to do that in uh, a particular neighborhood uh, within a city, we needed good information about the conditions of housing. Um, we ended up finding that there weren't really good uh, real-time uh, examples of um, parcel by parcel housing conditions. Uh, in this example, we found a um, software vendor out of Detroit, uh, Loveland Technologies, who adapted um, their tool. Uh, they, they originally called it a blexting app, uh, light texting. Um, send people out in the field with a phone and take pictures of houses and record information. We had them adapt that to uh, Google Street View um, and allowing us to use Google's uh, images of houses um, combined with a 53 item survey that we put together um, based on HUD um, <coughs> recommendations for housing characteristics. We married that to data from uh, the municipality, um, uh, code enforcement cases, crime statistics, fire calls. Uh, joined that to uh, American Community Survey. Um, joined that to Cone Health, our local um, hospital, uh, for uh, primary and secondary ER admissions and hospital visitations for asthma or respiratory related illnesses. 165 different codes uh, in that database. Uh, one quarter uh, worth of uh, uh, 2016 uh, was 6,200 visits. Putting all of that data together, 136,000 rows of data, 150 columns of data, more than 20 million cells, um, big data, uh, required a little bit of gymnastics. Um, some of it was using ArcGIS on a desktop. Some of it was uh, ArcGIS online, doing some hotspot mapping. Um, combining layers of information, um, uh, processing that in SPSS and doing a regression analysis. Turns out that when controlling for social determinants of health, gutters are the primary indicator, uh, the lack of gutters on a house, of respiratory illnesses within the community at the block group level. Um, we just finished that regression analysis a couple days ago and presenting later this week in New Orleans. Um, so it, to solve a question about what do we do at a neighborhood level to reduce respiratory illnesses among children, how do we shape a neighborhood level intervention <coughs> required bringing data from the federal level, from the local level, creating uh, very innovative ways of collecting data ourselves, and assembling that um, in, a, in a variety of manners. Now all of that's turned back out public facing. Um, we have uh, our GIS online with several maps that are facing back to the public so that they can access that information. Uh, the presentation I gave this morning was actually for pediatric residents who are doing uh, their residency at, at Cone. They've come out to the neighborhoods to see what are the social determinants, what are the housing determinants, um, what are the neighborhood level uh, interventions that can work um, to prevent uh, emergency department visits for children with uh, asthma. No, we should all probably just stand. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll give you two examples of some of the research projects uh, that we are doing. And these two in particular are um, a bit different from the other stuff that I do because they rely on open data sets. So the first one I'm going to talk about is this research uh, opportunity uh, that is funded through UNCG. Uh, is where we are looking at uh, how can Twitter be useful uh, during natural disasters. So we are studying all of the tweets that came out during Irma, Harvey, and Maria. And what we are trying to see is, um, are there any images that were taken by people during the storm which can help emergency managers make better decisions? So a prior research to this was funded by NOAA. And uh, when we uh, first analyzed Hurricane Sandy for this data, 
we showed them these pictures that were very prominent, uh, showing flooding in certain regions uh, and the depth of flooding too. Um, but what the emergency manager said was, well, you found out about 100 images from 11.8 million tweets, manually looking through it. Uh, what do I do with it? Uh, the other question was, how are we sure that this is really useful? Uh, is it biased for something? Is it uh, biased towards a certain demography of Twitter users? So then we set out, uh, out on a path which basically provided some provenance to these data by merging multiple data sets together. So now the research we are conducting is uh, basically based on merging Twitter data with geospatial data sets that were observed from NOAA by merging them again with census and ACS data where we weight them according to demographic population and basically have a scoring mechanism to say, well, yes, this tweet has a scoring mechanism of this and this is how reliable we think the information is. Now, would this any be possible if we didn't have access to open data sets? Be it Twitter's API uh, not giving us the data related to the hurricane, be it <coughs> Uh, ACS not providing us the data, be it NOAA not giving us rainfall information about when Maria or Arma went through that particular location? No, it won't be. So apart from this, when we are talking about big data sets, if we don't have open source tools and technologies, processing this on even the biggest ArcGIS server would be next to impossible for us. But we rely on open source technologies. I'm sure there is enterprise versions of Spark and Hadoop there, but at least they have open source technologies which can help us process this data faster. Another example I will give you is where we are trying to actually study reproducibility in science. So with a grant from Microsoft, we have access to about 160 million papers since publication of research papers. And uh, what we are trying to look at is, how does this board with the number of citations for a particular author for a particular paper? Can we actually predict the number of citations a particular paper is going to get? Now, some fundamental questions come into the picture which says, well, biology is very different from computer science. The number of citations for a particular journal in biology versus a conference in computer science is going to give you different publication results, right? Um, it also depends on what organization a particular author is affiliated to, who are their collaborators, how big is their network. So to study this, we actually had to merge a lot of data set, uh, which is basically getting us information about a particular organization. Uh, it is getting us information about a particular field of study. How are these fields of study related? Again, all of these are coming from data sets which are available in Europe. Uh, the organization data set is made available from Australia. Publication venue, um, uh, JSTOR score, which is basically how good a publication venue is. That is again also coming from Australia. All of these are open data sets that we are merging together to figure out a normalized citation metric for different uh, venues for different authors for different publication areas. Again, it's a huge data set, but none of this would be possible without open data sets provided through Microsoft or other organizations, even NSF, right? And not even possible without open source tools and technologies. So just to think about, uh, without open source data, it's a lot tougher to do cutting edge research. I actually have a slide, one slide. Is it okay if I can yeah, show sure. that? Press. It's on the. Is it on the? It's on here. Just let me press uh, ah. show rather than. <coughs> ah. Go ahead and talk, and I'll. Okay. Um, I, I, I like. I've, previous panelists use a fair bit of just open or accessible data that's uh, made available by the government or made available by other private sources. And also I, um, I'm involved just like the other panelists on the creation. So it's a two-way uh, interplay with all of the open products that I'm, um, all of the open, all of the work that I do. Uh, but I think this is not my slide. This is from Kramer and Bozen. It's a uh, two library and information scientists from Utrecht. 
And this is, whenever I have a project that I'm working on, I print this out. And this is just every single open piece of the academic tool chain that you can use uh, to make your work open. This is a checklist for me. I, will, I would love to check every single one of these. And I have tried to check many of them. But we can get into some of the resistance from that later. But this is just, there's always an open <coughs> way of doing something. And I rely on all of them as much as possible. It, on the bottom right is the DOI associated with it. So I can we'll get this on the website. Yeah. Pass this down. Yeah, sorry. Can I just want to off, Emily. I think you have Yeah. Um, so the next question sort of goes to the, the heart of this panel, I think, is uh, about your willingness to share your own data um, in an open, open access way. Um, especially in the context of P and T, you know, many uh, faculty. You know, in most institutions, I've done a, a number of interviews with them about uh, research data management practices and sharing it. And there is a, a reticence often to openly share the data that they collect because they look at it as a competitive advantage. It's something that, you know, they can use for their own subsequent research, even if it's, you know, been created, you know, created through the collection efforts with public funds often. So can you speak a little bit for just a couple of minutes each? about what motivates you to actively participate in open access work and, and share your data, whether it's creating, publishing, <coughs> disseminating, supporting, or advocating for open access. So kind of the broad question here. I, I'm going to start with a, an example. Um, you heard from Jim Albright this morning. Um, we've got a, a series of projects with the county under the Metro Lab um, organization, it's a, a network affiliation uh, that brings uh, local governments together with universities to partner. Uh, some uh, applications are, are, are built that are technical, some applications are built that are really about uh, providing more open access to, to resources and information. My involvement on, on this project is really around the solving of problems. Um, complex social problems require collaboration of many people, and good collaboration requires access to information. Um, so it's kind of a natural fit to work on a team with many different uh, organizations uh, participating and find the best ways in which we can access the information, understand the information from our various uh, disciplinary viewpoints, and then use that to solve problems. Um, in, in this case, we're looking at three um, uh, key issues. Uh, opiate uh, overdoses within our community and, and how we address that uh, with a data science um, uh, uh, slant on it. How, how do we both find where to target our resources as well as track if we're actually solving the issue. Um, second is evictions. In this county there were 16,000 summary ejectment filings last year. Um, 16,000 people who were potentially going to be evicted. Um, our follow-up on that, um, we found that there was uh, easy enough access to just the counts of how many evictions there were, but none of the rest of the information. As we dove into that project, I sent a team of six students to the courthouse, to the dungeon in the courthouse, the court records, where there's no Wi-Fi, we learned the hard way. Um, I had designed a, an online tool for them to look at the summary ejectment cases and input the information. In the end, they had to take snapshots with their phone, bring it back to the office, and then hand input. Uh, just Greensboro, 12,000 cases. We took one month. Uh, about 1,400 cases period in that, in, in that one month. Um, we shouldn't have to scrape data from public access pieces of paper that should be captured in some kind of a system. Uh, Song is helping us out here. The system literally was written in 1987 in DOS and hasn't been updated. Um, and it, it, it's impossible to get uh, good, rich information out of it. We followed up with individuals who had been evicted last year, 20 individuals, and found that about half of the families that faced eviction also ended up homeless for a period of time, uh, either precariously housed with family members in other homes, sleeping on the sofa, 
uh, living in a motel, uh, sleeping rough, uh, living in a car. Um, and that's a, that's a real drain on our uh, society. Um, evictions leading to displaced families, leading to homelessness. But also, those who were rehoused were rehoused in less quality homes. Uh, they now have a strike on, on their um, uh, record. Number one evictor in the community. Anybody guess? Public housing. Public housing. What do you do when you're evicted from public housing? So, so these questions require us to have political allies, require us to have uh, government uh, uh, functionaries who are sharing information with us. We need sheriff's writs of possession. We need uh, data on land use. We need uh, information on uh, the advocacy organizations and homeless uh, uh, shelters and how many people they're serving. All of this has to be gathered and uh, analyzed and uh, put together in a way that we can make sense of, out of it and then address the issues. And how does that relate to PMT? I'm not sure. I'm up next year for full. Um, and I'm trying to figure out the narrative. Um, how, how do we make the narrative? I don't publish in just traditional uh, uh, journals. Uh, much of what I do is public speaking. Um, I did a TED talk two weeks ago. That was kind of neat. Where do I fit that in my PMT? Um, I do a lot of government reports. Um, I'm doing research for a department in human relations and fair housing. Um, how do we count those? How many journal articles of what factor uh, uh, with what uh, references? With, you know, how do we think of, through the, the problems in a very traditional discipline like sociology? Um, how, you know, what's my theoretical contribution? Um, I do lots of conferences. I do lots of um, um, uh, presentations to uh, academic audiences. But how do you, how do you count that? So wrestling with those uh, issues is, is a very current and real thing uh, uh, for me in my uh, uh, stage of um, promotion. Um, as a junior scholar going up for an assistant, uh, I did twice. I worked twice. Um, I started as a visual sociologist. Um, I had just shot a documentary on youth homelessness in, in Tempe, Arizona. It's up online, uh, Street Life on Mill. 1.88 million views on YouTube. Find me somebody's journal article that gets 1.88 million reads. I get daily a feed of comments on it, and some of them are kind of crazy comments, but I, I get daily a feed of people are still commenting. I shot this video in 2002, put it up on YouTube in 2004. I'm still getting, it's still relevant um, to, to people. Um, how do you count that? As a junior scholar, I didn't. There wasn't a way to count it. Um, I, I wrote three articles and got uh, other pieces out about that, but I couldn't count the thing that's really getting uh, the attention. That's changing. We're, we're seeing across the board uh, ways to think about um, uh, the public delivery of sociological information as uh, a scholarly product. Uh, I like that word, scholarly product, instead of an article. So when we are talking about uh, openness in science, so my uh, my priority along with uh, researchers that I collaborate with is for any research that we do, we need to have three things that are pretty much open. And again, this is basing on uh, my research mostly depends on data sets. Okay? So the first thing that we go for is we want to have an open source publication. Right? So we want to only publish in open source venues. There's a good reason behind that. I'll come back to uh, why in particular. Um, we also develop our algorithms as code or software. We want to make that open source too. The third thing is making the data set that we use, because we would have transformed that data set from its raw original form to something that we have used, to a normalized form that we can publish outside. So with all of these three things, what we are aiming for is a reproducible science aspect. So using, so a particular new researcher can come into and uh, search for that particular paper, read through it, has the data set and the code to reproduce whatever science that we have done. We make sure that uh, the code base is linked with the paper, the data set is linked with the paper, 
and the data set is also linked with the code. So they can just download all of the three things and they can run the code, get the results out of there. The reason for doing this is it pushes the boundary of science faster. It's as simple as it gets. I get more citations on my open science papers and journals than I get from my closed source publications that I had done when I was a PhD student. Um, one of the biggest reasons why we did that at that point was because open science was pretty new. Uh, no one knew how well it is going to do. We didn't have a scoring mechanism for those journals or uh, conferences. We didn't know how it would count for my resume when I was getting hired over here or how it would go well with the promotion or tenure committee, um, all of that. But now, when we think about it, citation comes into the picture, right? So it is easy for a new researcher to come uh, work with my data set and increase the boundary of that particular research much easier than if they have it in a closed source journal or publication. For example, we don't have access to IEEE publication. Any paper that I search, that's not available to me. I actually have to ask one of my other colleagues who are in different universities to get me access to the paper, which I should have said, I guess. But, um, <laughs> I mean, you can see, so it, it's stopping me from actually reading a particular scientific discovery, which was funded through federal dollars, which should be open source. Right. Uh, and it should be published outside so that people can get access to that research. So for that particular initiative, I generally go for something which is <coughs> reproducible in <coughs> science completely. So I'm really glad that you brought that slide up. And I'm, I was happy to see a lot of the things that we use on that thing. So pretty cool. <coughs> yeah, so um, the provost started this morning by saying that the ENT process is supposed to capture critically important scholarly products. And pretty much every talk and panel discussed these scholarly products. For me, as a, I'm young and dumb. So for me, the code, the data, the figures, those are scholarly products. So it's important for me and for early career people, I think in general, to make those citable, to make those persistent, to make sure that uh, we're creating diverse artifacts that can go on our, our CVs and, and show what we do, as opposed to deal with the latency between, I write a grant, I, it gets rejected. I write it again, it gets accepted, and then I do the work, and then I deal with the data analysis. And then I do more data analysis and I submit the journal article. And all of a sudden, five years later, the work is finally being published, but there's all of the shadow work that's been done in the interim. And that shadow work, I think, can uh, be reflected uh, in an open and transparent way to both the university members who we know uh, and outward facing to the community to show that what we do as uh, scholars. So all of what the open products that we have um, and can show for our work for those five years before something comes up and something becomes available. So, yeah, and to me also, what motivates me is I find that the paper is probably the least interesting part of other people's work. Um, <laughs> the data is very interesting to me. The code is very interesting to me. The um, decision, the choice points that they made as they did the work. If I can read their grant proposal or peer reviews, there's a lot of open peer review that goes on in my field. If I can read those things, I get great amount of insight. The paper ref reflects some highly refactored jewel of an object. There's all the stuff that's been cut away that's very interesting to me and can lead me to new insights too. And I hope that my desiderata leads other people to new insights. So I think that that's part of what motivates um, you know, being in excited about these open issues. Well, we've already been um, bridging into the next two questions, actually. So um, I think I'm going to combine them into one big question for you each to address. And uh, I hope we can reserve some time for questions from the audience as well. Um, could you each comment about what you see as, um, or elaborate on, uh, things you've already mentioned that are barriers to your work, to open access uh, to information by scholars more broadly, and what recommendations or next steps that you might have for support, supporting open access to information in a scholarly context, and especially 
as regards PMT? I think disciplinary boundaries have been a, an issue um, in the past. Um, it's beginning to break down. Um, we have an interesting institute here, Institute for Data Evaluation and Analytics, um, when I came into the first of these meetings, um, I was meeting people from the business school and from the computer sciences and from these departments across campus that I didn't know. They, they weren't even in the social sciences. Um, I, I was working with you know, those people. And, and I found that they had a different language for some of the same problems that I was working on. Um, breaking down those disciplinary boundaries <coughs> means work teams that are flexible, responsive, uh, potentially easier to fund, um, uh, really attractive uh, to solving issues. Um, I'm learning a lot about Soumya and Soumya's work, um, and I'm, I'm like, wow, if I had had him like five years ago on this other project, we would have been. Um, there's, there's so many more opportunities that are available uh, as those disciplinary boundaries uh, come down. I think some of the other uh, issues that I'm finding uh, are, are really logistical issues of being in the institution itself. Operating on a semester basis while your counterparts in the community operate on a year-long basis is very difficult. I get helpers for three to four months. I get them trained, they go away. I get them trained, they go away. Um, you, you get them just to the point where they're being useful and, and, and they're gone again. Um, that doesn't work very well with the flow of work when you're a communi community engaged scholar. So finding ways to make a consistent uh, workflow across a 12 month period or, or even multiple years um, has been a, a challenge at times. Um, the thinking like an academic is also a barrier at times. Um, thinking like a person in the community who has an issue that needs to be solved. Um, I like to think more like nonprofits than like an institution that's meant to be here for hundreds of years. A nonprofit is around with whatever skeletal funding it can find. It's there to solve an issue that's right now relevant, uh, affecting the community. It's very responsive as those, uh, those problems change quickly within the community. Um, and so I, I, I like to try to think like that um, in my work. Um, I might be on a project for four years, and I might be on another project for three or four months as we solve that issue and move on to, to another one. So trying to change the way I think as an academic about a problem. Um, is also uh, uh, one of those barriers to overcome. Um, in terms of barriers, so one of the biggest barriers that I have seen in interdisciplinary research is people holding on to their data, uh, literally. And um, what I mean by that is interdisciplinary research is very, very interesting. Um, so when I got here, I was advised uh, that uh, you're spreading yourself to thin, and you should focus in on one particular area. But that's boring, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, interdisciplinary research is where you actually uh, use a particular algorithm, or you develop a particular new algorithm, or you do some really cool work, and you see its effect immediately, right? Uh, I mean, I, I could be in, in my office all day long developing an algorithm for five years in computer science, and then it gets published in a paper. But here, I can see the results in six months. But that, this research, one of the biggest hindrances would be people not sharing their data or what they have done. Um, some concerns that arise from there, they generally say, oh, this is private information, there is HIPAA issues with this, or um, we don't want to share it, I don't know if it violates privacy policies. So knowledge on how to share data becomes very, very important. Uh, the same goes for um, when we get evaluated on if we actually were able to develop a data set which could be publicly shared. Um, so the work that goes into it, it's a lot of work. Um, just to give you an example, if we want to get a data from Cone and we want to publish it outside, we actually have to filter it a lot before uh, you can even send it out for publication, right? But um, no one, I mean, 
we don't consider that work to be a part of your research, right? That's just work that you have to get done to publish a paper. Right? So those things need, needs to change a little bit, or the thought process in those things would, would, if they change, it would help quite a bit. Um, my biggest barrier is my older colleagues, primarily, um, who would probably rather use my toothbrush in the morning rather than submit to some of these open science practices. Uh, I would put money on it. Uh, it's difficult to change people's minds. They feel like they have the most to lose, whereas I feel like I have the most to lose. So it's a difficult conversation that I haven't figured out how to have. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yes. <laughs> well, I'm going to give our panelists the last word in a moment, but I thought I'd pause first and see if we have questions from the audience that we could address. Andrew. I'm curious why the presence of gutters affects respiratory. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was wondering that too. Um, I At first I thought it would be the roof. Um, you know, if there's a hole in the roof, you're going to get water inside, it's going to um, cause mold. Um, water content triggers asthma. Um, there's a couple, there may be a spurious relationship. Um, the same neighborhoods in Greensboro that do not have gutters are 1920s to 1940s construction. They haven't been updated and upgraded in that time period. Uh, they're mostly rental. Um, when controlling for rental, uh, it, it remained um, significant when controlling for all of the social determinants of health it remained uh, uh, consistently uh, significant uh, bad paint was the other that was sometimes significant and sometimes not um, depending on the model bad paint is a tells you that uh, repairs are being done um, it, it's the outside upkeep who knows what's going on inside if they're not painting the house gutters um, if we're thinking structurally, water sheaves off, comes straight down onto the foundation, goes underneath the house, um, wet flooring. Um, often you don't know that you have a mold issue under the carpet um, that would trigger uh, asthma. Wet underneath the house also is a nice space for cockroaches and other pests. We know that uh, particulate um, from cockroaches is a huge trigger of asthma. And then if you're trying to combat pests and insects uh, with pesticides, that's another trigger um, uh, for, for asthma. So there's some logical linkages, but there's also probably a spurious relationship with um, uh, neighborhoods. Um, that analysis was done at the block group level, and it was the whole city, um, so 169 block groups, and we controlled for income, race, um, all the social determinants, uh, neighborhood effects, uh, market conditions. Other questions? Yes? Uh, talking about making your data openly available, and we're also talking about how junior researchers might feel as though that's a barrier to them losing their research voice. Well, do you guys have any suggestions for how what we tell those researchers as to why they should make their data openly available? Is it just you, your data won't get cited even if your analysis doesn't? Is it uh, changing the promotion and tenure guidelines? Like, how do we, how do we solve this problem? The question was about how do we motivate junior researchers to share their data? Would like to answer. <laughs> Sorry. I'll, I'll take it on. Um, so, if for nothing else, um, you if you did your research on some open data set, you should give back something to the community. Uh, if if not that, then. Uh, Citing of your data would be an important factor which if we change our promotion and tenure guidelines a little bit Where we can say that okay my data set that I have generated over here has X number of citations And has been used in these top level journal publications that would be very important um, Just to give you an example um, I don't know how many of you know this so uh, in USCIS, if you're applying for a green card and you are applying for an outstanding researcher, you can use uh, open data set publication as one of the fields. So why cannot, can it not be used uh, over here? I just want to add to that. Um, I think that 
it shows early on that you create something. And I think that that's a very valuable thing, especially when publications might come later. And people in general are quite nice. Uh, they will not scoop you. I mean, in my field, scooping is, a, is something that is talked about, but rarely ever done. So uh, if you write, and you can license your, you can put in the licensing file, hey, I would really love to be a part of any product that comes from this data. So there are very simple ways by using simple modes of being kind to one another or human interaction that you can avoid problems down the line that I think people don't necessarily understand because it's so new. So I think that there's a lot of, com you're, um, once you get over a bunch of people telling you you're going to be scooped, it usually ends up being quite good. Can I, can I add to that? <clears throat> so when I, was, I, when I was doing my dissertation, I was working on this Texas slavery project thing I showed very briefly. And a lot of my friends in the graduate program were saying, don't do that. Someone will obviously take this and run with it and go do something, which is mildly absurd, actually, mm -hmm. to think somebody else was interested in the same thing. I had enough time. Exactly what I was doing. And would like go, oh, I found this. <laughs> now I can be nefarious yeah. and take it and go <laughs> do something with it. Um, but the opposite was my experience, is that by claiming the space early, by saying I'm working on this, this is in process, as you said, before the product actually happened, it was, it was good to let people know and feel that I was working on things, and, and the result was sort of, a, as you described, sort of good Samaritan. I had people email me saying, hey, have you seen this? Have you looked for that? And I found out about things I probably would not have otherwise stumbled on in my own research. And so it only had a good multiplier effect for me by being open about the work I was doing as I was doing it, which is what we do at conferences anyway, with conference papers yeah. and things like that. This is just a, I would argue, a much more open platform for, for inviting the broader conversation. That, you know, at base, that is what scholarship is, right? An open and broad conversation. And it's way more pleasant than getting it as a referee report of you missed this citation, you missed this, you missed this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> So I promised I'd let our panelists have the last word. So let me hear each of you from each of you a one-liner about what we should, what you think we should best do to uh, advance open access in, uh, in uh, research. Yeah, and then what you start. A one-liner, we have to think. My feeling is actually I have a very radical idea associated with this, which is that. Um, you should get. You should have junior people uh, on PNT committees, or or have them involved in positions that they don't feel entirely comfortable being a part of, because I think they'll push things in a direction that is interesting. It might be wrong, but we're all scholars. It's okay to be wrong. You make a hypothesis, you test the hypothesis, and you go back and you you adjust things. So it's okay for things to be iter iterative. And I think that having people who are willing to stir the pot a little bit um, can be helpful for coming up with new ideas and new ways of doing things. So, but. So for a one-liner, I would say make all of the older faculty attend open data workshops. <laughs> <laughs> but all jokes aside, having more workshops uh, related to open data policies, open data avenues um, is really important. The whole domain is changing quite a bit. I mean, in six months, the venues that were on the slide, there might be a few more added to it. Um, so having that knowledge with uh, more workshops, more conferences where open data platforms are basically advertised uh, would be a really good thing to have. Formal norms changing formal norms, thinking about how we create formal norms, the language that we use, and how it's very restrictive usually, especially in, in institutions like governments and, and universities. When those, those normative structures say, this is allowed and this isn't allowed, they ossify. They, they, um, they replicate themselves very well over time, but, but they, they don't create innovative structures that allow new advances. So paying attention to the language that's used. Uh, we're rewriting the PNT guidelines for my department. Uh, community engagement is no longer under service. It's now under scholarship. And we're not talking about articles and how many journal articles worth of uh, a book is for journal articles. And a journal, we're talking about scholarly products. So 
using using words that are open ended. Um, I'm arguing that someone else might come along and, and have a documentary video, and, and we should count that. Um, somebody else might come along and have some other thing that we haven't thought about yet. We need to write now to be as open and flexible as possible. So, so changing those formal norms. Please join me in thanking our panelists.